Hello, one and all, and welcome to the podcast we call The Fantastival with myself, Steve Nussbaum, in the podcast where I invite my guests to come on, talk to me all about their musical tastes, their memories, their experiences, and they get to collect their fancy festivals, which I have christened Fantastivals. We are back after a summer away. We are now here with episode number 137. I hope everyone had an amazing summer. I went off to Menorca with the family. It was an amazing time. I felt very refreshed. I felt ready to go again. The kids are now back in school, but there's a heat wave in the UK. So I hope everyone is keeping cool. I hope everyone's been well and had the best summer possible. And like I said, it feels like ages since I've recorded one of these episodes. It's actually been the longest break since I started the Fantastical Podcast. So I'm really looking forward to getting back into the swing of a weekly routine. And I couldn't think of any better guests to have to get back in the swing of this. So it's episode 137, like I said, back with a bang. As joining me this week is singer, songwriter, guitarist, author. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the amazing Mickey Bireni. Hello. Nice to be here. Mickey, welcome to the podcast. I'm so glad I've got you on the podcast. I can't wait to hear about your fantasy festival and talk about all your musical tastes and your experiences. But I always like to open up these podcasts by finding out how my guests are doing from like a mental health perspective. I think it's really important we talk about how we're feeling. So, Mickey, how are you? I'm OK. That's usually my answer, actually, because I always have to stop and think. I got back from End of the Road Festival on sunday at midnight and yes my my days of festival camping may be nearing a close just because at 56 it's you know like i mean and also i did do quite a few festivals this year so i went to a couple and i'm a bit kind of camped out like i'm i queuing for toilets in that morning sort of uh oh i need the toilet now <laughs> <laughs> And then there's a queue and it's a composting toilet and it stinks and it's just not, it's not the best way to start the day. And, you know, I'm all kind of bent and cramped from rolling off a mat and you know what it's like, right? And, you know, when I was young, it was really exciting. Like I really noticed, I went to Glastonbury this year as well and I took my son, he had an absolute blast. For me, right, way too big to begin with. I mean, it's amazing, <laughs> right? It's It really is amazing. I'll give it that. But I just was, first day, I think I was just having a kind of constant panic attack. But it did cross my mind that if I was 19 years old, I'd think, this is amazing. But at my age, you actually think, this is a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> So who it's did you like setting up a tent in like fucking Oxford Street or something <laughs> and staying there for four days? Like it's too much. Who did your son enjoy in in Glastonbury? And do you have like a similar musical taste to your son? Um, I don't really have similar musical tastes, and that's quite good because he like he really enjoyed Phoenix. He enjoyed Lana Del Rey. He I can't think what else he went to see. There's quite a few things. I mean, he had a great time. The one thing that he was like, oh, come and watch this with me. We watched Thundercat. That's right, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This is probably someone incredibly famous, right? And I'm talking about it like it's someone who's played downstairs at the Sacklewell <laughs> Arms or something. Anyway, the point is, is that it's not my kind of music. I would never have chosen, like if, if Moose had put it on the rec- like on the record player, I'd have been like, oh, fucking hell, can we take this off? Like... There's no, you know, I wouldn't have gone to see it, but because it was Glastonbury and mm. I was with Ivan and we were watching it. I mean, it, it did take me about three songs to even make out what was going on because it was really improvisy and whatever. And I, and it, and I started to get it and I was like, oh, actually, this is, wow, this is actually pretty impressive. And by the end of it, I was really into it. And I just thought, so that's the Glastonbury moment, isn't it? Because I think. You know, in a funny way, although we're doing this thing about my ideal pick or whatever, for me, the real pleasure of a festival is seeing something that is totally unexpected Mm. and finding yourself liking it that you would just wouldn't have gone to see. You only went because they happened to be playing in the field you were standing in. Do you know what I mean? And I think so that was, yes, Santa Cat was my big Glastonbury moment. I think I really enjoyed it. But um, so, yeah, you know, he's he's. He loves it. I mean, he's 18. So, you know, hey, perfect age. Doesn't mind the camping, all of that. I am I will hand over to him, I think. I think <laughs> that I shall pass the mantle over at this stage. <laughs> <laughs> 
So what about yourself then, uh, Mickey, in terms of like your musical upbringing, what are like your earliest musical, your earliest musical memories? Um, I mean, I think like from childhood, it's, you know, my parents weren't particularly into any kind of contemporary music. I mean, a bit, you know, whatever's on the radio. But I think, I mean, a lot of the, the things I like the songs when I was little were like off TV programs and Hollywood kind of musicals and do you know what I mean? It wasn't like I had, you know, something like my dad listened to Bob Dylan or something and I got into something really cool <laughs> at an early age. Yeah. Um it was just yeah, chart stuff and, you know, Una Paloma Blanca when we'd go on holiday to Spain or something. So it's just the obvious. I mean probably <clears throat> the time when kind of more started getting into music was probably around I mean, you know, I mean, you know, it was a good time for, for charts even, you know, with bands like Blondie and kind of Pretenders and, you know, all of those bands and kind of in that punk era, a lot of that was actually in the charts and on top mm. of the pops. So it was very accessible. But I think, you know, school became the main thing because, you know, you're, especially for someone like me, because I've moved around a lot of schools. Mm. So it's like really tiresome being the new person all the time. And... I also kind of suffered from the fact that it wasn't like, you know, racism as such, but a lot of people didn't really like Japanese people weren't that common in the UK. And so you did get a lot of, you know, people pulling their eyes into slants and yeah. saying, oh, so I mean, it was, you know, I, I, I always have to sort of contextualize this and say that it wasn't like, you know, people treating you like you're disgusting or being really abusive, but it was just kind of, I mean, everyone got the piss taken out of them yeah. at school, but you felt very, you did feel, I did feel a bit othered, you know, and I think wanting to fit in, music is quite a good way. Sport is good, but music is also good. And I think when I went to this school in Ladbroke Grove, which I was only out for a year, lots of the girls were into like ska and, you know, madness and specials and la 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 and getting into that. And I was quite good at art. So I used to draw all the kind of ska girl from the beat and decorate people's pencil cases for them you know to avoid getting beaten up that kind of thing so it's good bartering and uh knowing all the words to baggy trousers that was a kind of you know real show of strength for there you know so i think i got into music probably always on quite quite aware of the sort of social mm. glue of that you know and the kind of slight tribalism of it which is not a bad way in, I'd say. No, not at all. And, and was it that that made you want to go and pick up an instrument and then kind of learn how to play it for, in terms of that social aspect and that school aspect? I mean, possibly in that, you know, when I, I think I started going to gigs when I was about, probably about 14. And that was like, you know, real chart stuff, like going to see, I don't know, Japan at the Hammersmith Odeon mm. or something. But um, London, I think, uh, in that kind of early 80s period, was gigs were really accessible they're very cheap there was no kind of like checking your age or anything you could get into anything and there was a you could there'd there be 40 gigs a night in london do you know what i mean and mm. ranging from the tiniest pubs to the kind of like i say the odeon or the palais yeah. or something and it was you know you'd often sort of see the same people at different things there was lots of kind of different factions and scenes but you know i sort of started dipping into all of those and discovered a kind of you know, just a whole other world that was full of like little networks and people selling fanzines and people in bands. And, you know, you didn't, I don't know, everyone was kind of joining in. It was a bit of a free for all. So I think being in that environment was the thing that made it seem plausible to be in a band. I mean, the first band I played in was the Bugs, who were a garage band. And I was, you know, I, I used to go and see them. And then they're they had a double bass player called Lloyd who was going to live in San Francisco and they were like, oh, we're looking for a bass player. And I was like, I'll play bass. <laughs> so, you know, never played bass in my life, right? I had about five days to learn their set, having never, never, never played bass. Amazing. And my boyfriend, Johnny, taught me, like, simplified all the bass lines. And uh, <laughs> so it was just, it was, I suppose it was quite punk rock in that way that you could just kind of jump on board and, and see where it took you. Yeah, and obviously it takes you into uh, a few bands later. You end up in Lush, which is obviously, I guess, the band you're probably most well known for. One of the first, I guess, quote unquote, shoegaze bands. I guess looking back now, Mickey. I mean, 
What do you remember about that time? Because to me, that seems like a bit of a golden era of music. I mean, I'm only 43 and my kind of golden period of music is like mid 90s in my eyes. But looking back, what do you remember about, about that time? Well, it's so funny that you say that because, I mean, I suppose that's the thing about kind of retrospectively sort of assessing these scenes, because if you went by something like the music papers, when Britpop came along, they were like, oh, at last, you know, like everything was shit beforehand, mm. apart from Manchester, probably, you know, they loved all that. But they would have, you know, if you'd have asked someone at that time, you know, the idea that those kind of like slow dive ride, lush, that all of those bands would survive mm. and that influence bands 30 years later, you'd have been laughed out of the room. It would have been like absolutely no way. So it didn't feel like a thriving scene. It felt like a nice scene. You know, we would play with the Valentines and we toured with Ride and these are all lovely people and we had a great time. But it didn't feel like anyone thought it was important apart from, you know, a handful of like real enthusiasts. And most of the time you just spent apologising for existing. You know, it really <laughs> was not, you know, <laughs> it wasn't at all a kind of yeah, we are, we've landed, you know, we're really making changes. <laughs> Nobody thought that. And I guess, obviously, recently, you've seen the vinyl release of like Spooky, Split and Love Life on vinyl now. So, I mean, how have you found, you must have obviously had to revisit those albums to, to get back into, I guess, the swing of releasing that. How have you found looking back on those albums? Um, I mean, it's really difficult. I find it so difficult to listen to my own stuff because it's, really difficult to be objective you know I can just hear the mistakes and thinking oh shit I wish I'd have done this or yeah. I wish I'd done that I mean yeah you know I mean I, I like them I'm proud of them it feels like an achievement and it's quite nice to actually because when I was doing a lot of the book talks I've got me and Moose and a, another friend Ollie we sort of you know the three of us would perform like a handful of Lush songs to go along with the, the chat and it was quite nice relearning those songs and being a little bit taken by surprise and thinking, God, actually, there's quite a lot of depth to mm. them. You know, we did try very hard to sort of craft songs well. So, yeah, I suppose looking back and thinking, and we didn't know what the fuck we were doing. So I think <laughs> given that, I think it's not, not a bad achievement at all. And, and you know, it's not, I mean, I always get into trouble for sort of denigrating Lush. And I'm not denigrating Lush, but people are like oh, you shouldn't, you know, do yourself down. There's loads of fans and that makes them feel like, you know, you don't value that. And it's not that at all, I promise you. I'm very fond of the records and the, everything I did. I'll be honest with you, I don't really think about anybody that brilliantly. Like I do just think, you yeah, know, it's yeah. music. I don't sit there going, oh my God, I wish I I was in name A and other band of the yeah. period. I just think like, yeah, they're great. They're great or they're shit or, or I don't really care. I don't sort of put people on a genius pedestal, including myself. So, you know, the best you're going to get out of me is like, that's all right. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> if you could go back in time, Mickey, what would the Mickey of now say to the Mickey of Lush of that period? What would you go back and tell yourself? <laughs> I don't know. Calm the fuck down. Like, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you know, I'm, I sort of get asked about advice to younger musicians or to younger women or mm. to whatever the fuck, you know. And I just, what I'm mostly aware of is that nobody listens to advice, first of all, and certainly not from me. <laughs> and and I, I don't actually think it matters that much because I think you go through whatever tunnel you have to mm. go through and you have to learn those things yourself. I mean, I do think, you know, clearly there are issues around the kind of actual industry that I think, you know, when someone's promising you the fucking world, you know, just bear in mind that nobody knows what the fuck they're doing in the music industry. It's all <laughs> guesswork. And, you know, you can be lucky and you can have lovely people working with you. And it's, t for me, it's about surrounding yourself with good people who are actually decent and actually believe in you a bit, you know. But, you know, there's a million things I could say. Don't act like a dick. Don't let it go to your head. Don't fucking, you know, trust, you know, certain people, certainly if they're going to tell you that you're going to, you know, they, you know, the money thing. Oh, you'll, oh, you'll definitely be, you'll be making half a million by next year. Bullshit. You know, it's, it's <laughs> none of that ever 
materialized and if it does it's not because of the person who said that they were going to get you yeah. that much money it will be down to something completely different usually that you got used in a fucking advert or something <laughs> <clears throat> and i just think you know it is about it sounds really crap but it is just about enjoying it because i think it can easily tip over into mm. something that you get trapped in and you don't know why you're doing it anymore and um yeah keeping a hand on that tiller but i mean everybody knows that everybody knows that and it's only when you're in the middle of it that you think how the fuck did i end up here yeah. so it's always going to be the same <laughs> so you recently wrote your memoirs so you mentioned the book tour you uh wrote your memoirs fingers crossed how music saved me for success so i guess why why now why recently released the book and has it been a long process for you to, to, to get this over the line <laughs> Uh, I I wrote the book because I was asked to write the book. I didn't, <laughs> I, I didn't have it written and was then looking for a publisher. Right. I was I, um, the publisher I was with, which is Nine Eight, were ju like they were just starting up that imprint. Um, <clears throat> so they were clearly looking for people to write books, and I got approached. And it, you know, it took me a while to agree to it because at first I just thought it was a ludicrous idea, right. and I didn't think anyone would be interested i mean why the fuck would they do you know what i mean it's like bird out of lush has written a book well who gives a shit like so <laughs> i i think that i just and and you know pete was great pete selby who who was you know at nine eight and he i don't know he sort of coaxed me and you know he was really helpful because i keep saying this it really pisses him off when i say this but you know i'm not a writer and he mm. goes you are a writer and i'm like no i can write but I'm not yeah. a writer. There's a difference, and I think it's um, a, you know it's quite a weird thing writing a book. It's very isolating. You have to spend an awful lot of time in your own head, which is not a great place for me. <laughs> sometimes, you know, I kind of need to get out and see friends and stuff because actually, the kind of you know, I can sort of. I don't know, sort of over obsess and overthink, mm. and and actually, I spent a bloody year doing that with a book, and it was, you know, kind of quite. I suppose it was a bit like therapy, maybe. Uh, so it had its benefits, and it and it definitely felt like an achievement. And I did enjoy the writing. I do, you know, I've been a sub editor for mm. twenty years, so I've, I know it, you know, some things about it. But it is quite tricky. Um, I mean, I, I actually recommend it. It's a good exercise because. One of the weird things about writing a memoir is, you know, if you had, if, if I asked you, right, to write, uh, you know, kind of like map out your life and what you'd put in it. And you probably have ideas of like, oh, that would make a great anecdote. And I'm definitely going to put that in. And, you know, you might have some sort of quite emotional thing that you put in. The problem is, is those kind of landmark periods of your life, you've probably talked about them and discussed them. And they've probably turned into something that, isn't really what happened any do you know what i mean yeah, yeah, yeah. like you've sort of burnished it to make it funnier or more interesting than it actually was and i think going back to some of those key points in a life and having to really tease it apart and really think about what really did happen and whose fault was it and you know what were the consequences and what were the things that led up to it it's actually quite cathartic because you come out realising that it's really not what, which is probably like therapy, isn't it? You yeah, know? of course. I mean, I don't know because I don't really have therapy, but, I, you know, so I think it was, it was good. It was good. It was a good mental exercise in that way. And I think having to sort of be brutally honest about your own past is, yeah, it's not much fun, but it is quite interesting. Mm. Like, I think it's quite good for the brain. <laughs> I'm not really selling it to you, am I? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it sounds great. And it's, <clears throat> it seems like the book, to me anyway, has been really well received. Like, you've done a lot of, like, book signings and chats and you've, uh, like you said, been at the end of the road festival. So it seems like it's been really well received. I guess, are you surprised by how well it seems to have, have been received and the interest in the book? Um, yeah, you know, I mean, I'm kind of... I'm so used to after... Particularly after Lush, <clears throat> you know, you put records out. I mean... You spend all that time making a record, you put it out, and it's kind of vanished mm. within like a couple of weeks. It's all over. So I was kind of expecting that, really. I just thought, you know, I put a lot into the book because I just felt I've got one crack at this, so I'm I'm going to make it the best book I can. But I didn't expect it to do particularly well. 
again because I just thought, well, who the fuck cares? Do you know what I mean? Mm. Um, so, yeah, I was really pleasantly surprised. Now I'm fucking milking it for all it's worth. <laughs> like, every festival, every podcast, yeah, that's fine, I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> And obviously, if anyone wants the book, it's available, right, Mickey? If anyone wants to buy it, they can find it on various websites, various retailers, your own website, I'm guessing. Uh, is it available on my website? I'm so not up on these things. It's in bookshops. It's in you know, bookshops. You can find it, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I signed like about 500 for... Actually, if you've got a rare unsigned copy, that's probably worth <laughs> more on eBay. So. <clears throat> Genius. And then... Going back to music then, in terms of like your own musical taste, Mickey, what, what are you into? Are you across genres or is there kind of one genre that you're into? What what what, what, what do you like? Do you, I'm so, especially now, I'm so crap. Like I literally will listen to whatever crosses my path. So if a band supports me, I'll go, I'll go, oh, that were good. Or, you know, Moose actually goes to quite a lot of gigs. He's my partner, by the way, just in case you don't know. And... Uh, He's much more up on it. I just, um, I have to sort of have a band kind of waved under my nose for me to pay much attention. And uh, um, so that's that's kind of, so yeah, it's cross genre because I'm not into a scene anymore. You know, I just go where I'm kind of pointed at or like I say, if I'm at a festival and I go, yeah, they were good. And I, I'll have no idea how famous they are because people will go, oh, yeah, you know, that's their fifth album. And I'll be like, oh, shit, I've never heard of them. Like, no. But I think even when I was young, you know, when me and Emma, who was in Lush with me, when we first met at school, we, you know, and there was a, a, another three girls at school. We, there was kind of a group of us and we just went to everything. And like I say, that kind of early 80s period, it was very factional. You know, there was kind of, you know, people who were, I mean, it was kind of pre-goth a bit. Like, goth was almost separate. Goth was like the back cave, but then you had, like, positive punk, which was more like yeah. Southern Death Cult and kind of, you know, that sort of stuff. And then you had, like, anarcho punk, and then you had psychobillies, and you had the garage scene, and you had, like, all these little factional scenes, many of whom would not cross over with each other, whereas we went to everything. Like, didn't care. You know, King Pert one night, Sisters of Mercy the next you know, men they couldn't hang the night after, whatever, you know, whatever was out there, we went to see it. So I think I've always been quite cross-genre, if that's what it's called, yeah. <laughs> so there's loads of great music out at the moment. So there's a new album that I'm listening to by Spanish Love Songs. There's the new album from Mark Sharp and the Bicycle Thieves. It's amazing. New track from Dictator. So that's what I'm listening to. Anything that you're listening to at the moment, Mickey, or what was like the last album you listened to, whether that was a CD or a vinyl or Spotify? Um, what was I? I mean, I played in the Island of Egg. That was one of my great festivals of the year called Howling Fling. And that's kind of like the guy who puts it on is in a band called Pictish Trail, which uh, who I just loved. And anyway, they did this festival and there were all these bands playing. And there was a band called Brenda who were really good, good fun. And I got to see Rosie Plain, who I hadn't seen before. I know she's fucking really famous and everybody knows this is the kit. But I was like, I'd never seen them live and they were just wonderful. So I've been listening to her stuff quite a bit. I'm quite random. I mean, also, I tell you what, because I have to kind of work at, like, I'm, I've got to rehearse all this stuff. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff I end up listening to in a slightly work way and mm. I don't want to kind of like blow the romance of this but I get asked a lot of kind of oh you know oh blah 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 some publication wants your top 10 favorite albums yeah. but I don't have a fucking top 10 favorite albums I think it's a ridiculous demand to make so <laughs> I change them every time but that means yeah. having to kind of go through stuff and think oh no I, I did the au pairs last time I'll do someone else this time you know it's that kind of um, and then I have to sort of listen to everything and remind myself of what I, you know, blah, blah, blah. So it's a bit, it's a bit Bussum's holiday. So I don't actually get to just sort of relax and randomly listen to kind of, you know, I don't have like a sort of special feed that tells me, hey, this is what's hot and what's new this week. So I can <laughs> kind of get into stuff. Too much, too much other stuff going on. Like, and including this podcast, you know, I have to sit there and go like, oh, shit, okay, let's have a think about this. Who do I, who do I pick? Uh, partly what's interesting is because your thing is like a, an actual, it's about the live aspect. Mm. It, 
gave me a chance to look at um you know i think it's quite interesting that there's bands that i used to love seeing live but i wouldn't necessarily listen to them on record mm. do you know what i mean yeah, because absolutely. It, it's all about being there and you know equally other bands that i loved on record and you go and see them live and it's a bit mm, you know it's okay <laughs> you know? so i think that um there's a sort of different kind of aspect when you think of it as you know purely live and what you want to get out of that you know diff different roster to when you're picking your top 10 albums for instance yeah that's a very uh that's a very good way of looking at it let me ask you a question that isn't subjective what was the first record you bought and do you remember buying that record oh god i mean it was probably some fucking you know <laughs> children's theme tune <laughs> compilation you know, I used to know all the words to like the Sesame theme, Street theme tune and and kind of, you know, all the all the kind of, you know, the melodies to Thunderbirds, whatever. Aquamarina, that's a lovely song. Someone should cover that, really. I, I think in terms of going out and buying a record myself, you know, the problem is I didn't have a record player for fucking ages because my dad, you know, was just he was a bit you know crap actually i mean bless him he was you know, i loved him but he yeah. wasn't really up on that kind of stuff so he used to have to borrow his like tape kind of portable tape recorder it's quite shit <laughs> so i used to kind of shoplift at, um on oxford street and get tapes i think i think maybe the first one i shoplifted was teardrop explodes so there you go well let's count it as that then Great. kilimanjaro <laughs> <laughs> Great stuff, a, a shoplifting exclusive. I, w I hope it wasn't from HMV, Mickey, because that's where I work. I think I... it was from HMV. <laughs> <laughs> I did eventually get caught, actually, and was threatened with a court date. Um, uh, but the guy who... I, I had to have someone come round to our house to interview me and probably present me with a court date, and he just sort of sat there for an hour with me and just looked around my house and went like I think you've got enough problems as it is and <laughs> I was let off with a caution <laughs> oh man terrific terrific well you mentioned the fantasy festival of this podcast which is what it's all about so for anyone listening for the first time Mickey has the opportunity to collate her fantasy festival on this podcast so Mickey gets to choose any five acts one of who must play one of their studio albums in full and Mickey also gets to pick an encore, which all of her five acts can play to end her fantasy festival, which is one song can be by anyone in the world ever. So it's very simple. Five acts take five time slots. So in the last episode, I had Joe Peacock, who recently released his uh, State of Mind EP, which is fantastic. If you've not listened to that, please go back and listen. So he created his Mind Blown Fantasy Festival. In his opening slot, he picked My Bloody Valentine. In his super second slot, he picked PJ Harvey. In his Midway Madness Act, he picked Cap Captain Beefheart and had them play Trout Mask Replica. In his pre-headline act slot, he picked Jimi Hendrix. And for his headline act, he went for Bob Marley and the Wailers and had all of them play Paranoid Android to end his fantasy festival. So it's that simple, very easy, all good fun. But before we talk about your five acts, Mickey, you get to give your fantasy festival a name and you get to give it a venue. So what are you going to call your fantasy festival? Okay, I'm going to admit, right, that I literally sat and clicked the Zoom link and I thought, oh, shit. <laughs> 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 <Right>. <laughs> and the first thing that I don't know why the first thing that popped into my head was Banzai. <laughs> <laughs> because it's like Japanese. I don't know why it was like a moment of panic. And it might be like, I don't know, is it is it OK to use that? I don't know if it because if it's got World War Two connotations. I have no idea. But it's Japanese and it sounds like something you shout. So I just thought, okay, that would do. Yeah, that would do. I like that. So we've got Banzai and Mickey. You can take us anywhere in the world. You can take us back to Hammersmith Odeon. You can take us back to Glasgow. You can take us to America, Australia, Japan, wherever you want to go. We'll follow you. Where do you want to hold your fantasy festival? God, I'm going to be really boring and just go by my summer's experience. Because I, like I said, I just came back from the end of the road and it was beautiful there. Right. I mean, genuinely, it's like a lovely site. Um, yeah, but, you know, the problem is I don't want to camp. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so the other great festival I went to was Eview, which was at, um, at Bex Hill. It was at the Delaware Pavilion in the kind of gardens there. And it's kind of overlooking the sea. And that was great. And it was a really good venue and it was a brilliant festival. So I'm going to pick that 
just because it was, um, yeah, it was kind of no problem. You know, the fish and chips were great. There was a cocktail bar. There was a toilet within easy reach. And <laughs> I kind of need all those comforts. And plus it's by the sea, which is lovely. You know, it feels like a sort of, you know, summer holiday thing. But yes, I didn't think that I could be that exotic and go to like, you know, Melbourne or something. Thing, which probably would if it involved a free flight maybe that would be quite good but no i'm going to stick with bex hill because it's convenient all right so we're going off to bex hill we got the Barnza <laughs> festival before we talk about your five acts uh mickey any acts you want to mention just who you love but maybe because they're not great live or haven't been able to get into your final five that you want to give a shout out to <laughs> do you know what i kind of i started writing them down and i thought it's just going to be about 200 bands, yeah. right? It doesn't actually matter massively to me, right, who's on because I'll enjoy it. And all I, the thing is, right, is that it occurred to me that there's a lot of bands that I kind of, you know, especially bands that are really big where you can imagine them at a festival because they do festivals, you know, whether mm. it's Pulp or, I don't know, Susie and the Banshees or whatever. And there's a lot of those bands. The problem is, is that, I actually remember going to see Pulp when they reformed the first time. And I loved Pulp, right? But I went along and all it did was make me feel slightly depressed because I I could just vividly remember how young I was when yeah. I was going to see them regularly. And and so this is no slight on Pulp at all. It was just me. And I just thought, I'm not sure I want to feel like this at a gig, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> and I don't tend to feel like that when it's bands that I never saw. Not mm. to say that all my picks are bands that I've never seen, but I think that there's a lot of bands that I could pick that I absolutely worshipped, you know, at different stages of my life. But like New Order, you know, they were an amazing festival band, but it was just going to make me think, oh, my God, it's reminding me of being like 17 and yeah. being in a field at Glastonbury and how young I was and how amazing life was. Not that it isn't now, but... <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> it's not the same. <laughs> so yeah, there's just a very, very, very long list of bands that I could have put on. You know, I'd need almost like a sort of 365 day festival that can, you know, be on every day to to really put all the bands that I would happily see live. <laughs> you know, so this is just a very kind of this is my how I feel today pick. <laughs> brilliant stuff well you only get five i think any more than five i think the podcast would be such a long kind of process i think five is the perfect number and you get to have them at your bonsai festival so your opening act gets to play from two till three o'clock mickey so who are you going to have open the bonsai festival well i'm actually going to okay i'm sleep i'm cheating slightly already <laughs> because i'm gonna pick the kind of sort of milkshakes, head coats, Mighty Caesars. They're all kind of incarnations of Billy Childish's bands and incarnations of the girl group that would play with them, which would be the Del Monas or the head coatees. You know, that like the girls sort of morphed with... They were often the girlfriends of the actual band. <laughs> but it's sort of like... I think I know people who kind of really struggled with that sort of band and their kind of version of garage music because a lot of it's covers right and they'd be like well it's just a fucking covers mm. band and it's like i know but the thing is is if you can be a covers band and make those songs your own in the way that they did and bring that kind of punk rock edge and vibrancy and have a real proper night out with people dancing and it's hilarious and there's like you know, it's just, it, it's almost like there's a period of my life where that just encapsulated like a really, really fun, proper, great night out with no snobbery or illusions or fancy reviews in the NME. It was just a proper night out, which I think is sometimes, you know, not as well covered in music. You know, I love a, like a big gig and a, and a huge kind of fancy show as much as anybody. But I do think that idea of a band that is playing, you know, pretty much every fortnight somewhere in London and you go and see them and there's a crowd of people who go and you dance and you have a laugh, you know, they are, yes. So I would I would have the, you know, the Milkshakes, Headcoats, Delmonas, Headcoatees, Mighty Caesars, collective, you know, playing a load of songs throughout their history. And it would be a good opening because it would get everyone dancing. And also they always had the girls dancing down the front one of the few kind of garage kind of bands 
that didn't have like a load of sweaty blokes punching <laughs> shit out of each other down the front. They actually had girls dancing down the front. So it's a kind of, you know, safe space or whatever. Brilliant. The, the fantastical VRA uh, refereeing society have come to me. They said that's fine. So it's passed. You're allowed to have that act. It was a bit touch and go there, but it's passed. So we have that, those <laughs> as your opening act. They're going to play two to three. Great opening acts. We're going to take a half hour break. And it's time for your super seconds act. We get to play from half past three to half past four. So who's going to take your super seconds act, Mickey? Um, I'm actually going to pick the Kitchens of Distinction because, first of all, I think that they... I don't know. I, I, it's funny. I sort of struggle with where they were lumped into. Like, you know, there's a bit of a sort of shoey edge to them, but I just don't think of them as a shoegaze band. It seems really weird because I think their songs were a lot more kind of up, actually, than, you know, and, and, and pop songs. You know, they weren't sort of that kind of dreamlike quality. I never really got that from the kitchens, but I think because they kind of struggled to fit into a genre, they got quite overlooked. And But I'm going to admit that I'm picking them for quite selfish reasons because they are and were the funniest fucking people I've ever met. And also hmm. our kind of sound guy used to do their sound as well. Wow. So it's a good reason to get Pete there, which means I've got people to hang around with backstage who are going to make me laugh and you know, my great memory of playing with the kitchens was at the ICA. I can't remember what it was. I think it feels like it was something special because the ICA wouldn't have been any one person's gig. And we just sat backstage playing ABBA songs at the top of our voices. It was so much fun. And so I'd probably want to relive that bit as well as watch them play. That would be a requirement to sort of pop backstage in the half hour before they're on, have a bit of ABBA backstage and some incredibly stupid bands and then let them play. So... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Your fantasy festival, Mickey, you can go wherever you want. Backstage, you can be at the front, you can be at the back. So the kitchens of distinction, uh, your super seconds act. This is what I love about this podcast, right? It's the first time that at band have ever been mentioned on this podcast, 137 episodes in. So you never know quite which way people are going to go. So loving your first two choices. They play for an hour from half three to half four. We'll take another half hour break and it's time for your midway madness act. We get to play from five till six. So who are you going to have for your midway madness act? Um, well, I'm going to, like, this is how cross-genre I am. Having picked a garage act and a sort of indie act, I'm now going to pick the Jungle Brothers because, you know, um, I don't know a huge amount about hip-hop and dance music or any of it, right? But I went to see the Jungle Brothers probably only a couple of years ago and I had the absolute best night. Like, you know, at my age, it takes a lot to get me to dance all night and I was absolutely down the front absolutely loving it and they were amazing and I've got quite a I've got a lot of fondness for sort of you know some of that kind of old school kind mm. of you know hip-hop stuff that as much as I like a lot of the edgy stuff I like the kind of fun of them mm. you know it's there's a sweetness to them and you know De La Soul and all of that but do you know what I mean it doesn't feel like it's going to get really aggressive and nasty down the front like people again will be dancing and they'll be smiling and they'll be having a laugh and that is kind of what I want you know um, and also one of them is extremely sexy looking so everybody <laughs> needs a little bit of eye candy <laughs> I'll tell you a motive there I love it so Jungle Brothers playing five to six again First time the Jungle Brothers have been picked after 137 episodes as well. So, so far, really? yeah, absolutely. Fuck. So, three. Oh my God, yeah. I'm amazed. Yeah, so you're setting trends, Mickey. So, three new acts on our roster so far out of your first three acts. Got three down, two left to go. Your pre headline act gets to play from half past six to eight o'clock. So, Mickey, who are you going to have as your pre headliners? Well, having sat here and talked about safe spaces, I'm now going to pick, I'm now going to pick Ministry. <laughs> <laughs> And that will be my album, which will be the kind of Psalm 69 one, which I think is called something else that's all full of symbols, but I think everybody calls it Psalm 69. And um, I am kind of, again, bucking my own rules by reliving my past, because when we did, um, when Lush did Lollapalooza, Ministry were, I mean, they pretty much owned mm. that festival. I think it became clear that they were the kind of band of that year um, on stage. It was astonishing right I've never experienced and you know don't forget I came from a relatively sort of indie world in London mm. as many musical genres as I may have seen I was totally unprepared for this like absolute 
barrage of like noise and stagecraft. And, I mean, there must have been about, I mean, at one point they had like a load of dancers in sort of weird kind of Mad Max type gear. So there must have been about 20 people on stage and bones and you know <laughs> five guitarists and god knows what was going on it was astonishing and just the noise was amazing actually and i think that you know i that i mean i it's funny sort of thinking about that Lollapalooza because when i watched that um woodstock 99 you know that kind of absolute horror show oh, the documentary was on recently wasn't it on netflix and i can see that I can see how it ended up there because when we when Ministry were playing, I, it was the first time I'd seen that with people just going crazy. You know, there were like clods of earth flying into wow. the air, and but actually, it was kind of cool in a sort of tribal way. I mean, there were fires and all sorts, but it wasn't so out of control. It wasn't like violence towards each other. It wasn't things being thrown at the stage. It was just people going absolutely crazy to the music. So it felt like it was just on the right side of, you know, really exciting and slightly terrifying, but not crossing over into sort of full-on nastiness, I suppose, yeah. you know what I mean? And people just being aggressive and horrible to each other. So I would, yes, I'd quite like to see that show again, that exact same show, because it was, you know, it was probably one of the most impressive things I've seen. It's happening. It's happening at the Barnsley <clears throat> Festival. They like, play for an hour and a half. And again, believe it or not, Mickey, Ministry, first time they've been selected for a fantasy <laughs> festival. So you're four from four, uh, <laughs> which is fantastic. So like I said, Ministry are going to play their Psalm 69 album from half six to eight o'clock. One more half hour break. And then that takes us to your headline act. We get to play from half eight to 11 o'clock. So Mickey, who are you going to have headline your fantasy festival? OK, I'm now going to go for something more obvious, because I think if you've got a headliner, it, it, it sort of you know, it needs to be something that will transport you because it's just so that, like I said, you know, there's bands I could listen to live. There's bands that who I might not listen to on record and vice versa. But I think the Cocteau Twins are they kind of hit both for me. And I saw them. I mean, I saw them a few times throughout their career, but I do remember seeing them when they were doing like Heaven or Las Vegas. And it was you know, I think half the audience was in tears, you know, it was so moving. And I mean, yeah, I'm sure that everyone can eulogise about the Cocteau Twins and how amazing they are and their music and her voice and the epic nature of their music that is properly overwhelming. And I do think on a festival stage, which I never saw them on, I think they could fully kind of, you know, bliss everyone out, you know, and by then I'll be quite drunk. I'll have, <laughs> I'll have used up all my kind of manic energy on ministry. So I'll be wanting a kind of, I just need something that's going to carry me off and, and finish the night in a, uh, on an emotional sort of note. Great choice. You may be surprised or maybe not. First time Cocteau Twins been picked on this podcast. Ooh. What have you done? What have you had on this fucking podcast, right? Unbelievable. So maybe, maybe someone not as old as me. That's maybe <laughs> So five for five in terms of new acts on the podcast. So Cocteau Twins headline your fantasy festival. At the end of their set at 11 o'clock, they bring Ministry, the Jungle Brothers, the Kitchens of Destruction. Uh, yeah, Distinction. Distinction. Distinction, sorry. And loads <laughs> of incarnations of female bands, including the Milkshakes, back on stage. You've got you can even go on stage if you want as well, Mickey. You've got a wealth of talent on your stage, and they'll get to play one song to end this fantasy festival. What are you going to have them play? Um, I'm going to pick "Be My Baby" by the Ronettes because I think you need something a little bit anthemic that everyone can sing along to. At you know, if you're going to do something like that, and I think that. Funny enough, when I was thinking about that song and I was thinking, oh, my God, I've got to get all these different <laughs> genres of bands together. And it did make me think, well, you could go in lots of different mm. directions with that song. Like it could be played really garagey. It could be played like you could do like a hip hop version. You could do like a kind of industrial version because it's just got a great melody that can sit over anything. And, you know you could almost weave into all of those genres that make it a good kind of like 20 minute epic, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, ending with Liz's vocals at the end, soaring above it all. So I think that would be a, a 
powerful conclusion to Banzai. That would be a very powerful conclusion. So let's lock your fantasy festival in. So we've got the Banzai Festival, which is taking place in Bexhill at the Delaware Pavilion, I think we said. In your open act, we've got incarnations of female bands around Billy Childish, and you mentioned Milkshakes and lots of other bands. So they're going to play two till three. Half three, we've got the Kitchens of Distinction, five till six, Midway Madness, the Jungle Brothers. Pre-headline app, we've got Ministry playing Psalm 69. And for your headline app, we've got the Cocteau Twins. And for your encore, all your acts are going to play Be My Baby. Sounds like an amazing fantastical to me, Mickey. You happy to let that one in? Absolutely. <laughs> amazing stuff. So before we finish then, Mickey, you've got a lot of activity going on for the rest of the year, right? So I know you've got a few gigs coming up supporting Gang of Four. Yeah. Yes. Interesting. So basically, I think... It's this kind of a weird sort of nascent moment for a new band because the band sort of started just to play a few lush songs at book events. And then we got asked to do, well, first of all, we played with a wedding present. Oh. They asked us to support them. And I was a bit like, well, we're not really a band. Do you know what I mean? And then I thought, fuck me, it's the Shepherds for Empire. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you've got to say yes to that. Absolutely. Right? Um, and so we were like, okay, shit, quickly, write some songs. So we had a couple of songs, at least, that we knew. And then the Gang of Four have asked us to tour with them. So um, now we're thinking, okay, well, I'm not fucking saying no to the Gang of Four. That's like, because my thing is, it's like you go on tour with a band, you get to see them every yeah. fucking night. What could be better? So, yes, I'm, I, I'm spending the next couple of weeks hastily trying to write some songs for this band and I quite like that organic way of it growing out of something though rather than really planned yeah so we're now just going like oh well fuck it we might as well do an album right <laughs> you know? so that that gives me somewhere to head to for next year yeah that was going to be one of my questions in terms of 2024 then is there a pro it sounds like there's an album then potentially on the horizon yes yeah yeah we'll definitely get that together at some point and yeah we might mm. Is this an exclusive? Maybe. I'm looking at maybe doing some dates in America, right? Wow. It's just very, very only a possibility at the moment, but I'm looking at it because I always get that. You know, whenever I yeah. bloody put a date up on social media, it's like, why aren't you playing here? And why aren't you playing in my back garden or whatever? But I think, um, yeah, it might, might, might happen. It's just incredibly expensive and difficult mm. to get it together. I don't know if Americans realise how fucking difficult it is for british <laughs> artists to play yeah. there like i suspect they have no idea you know i think when lush was going it was actually a lot easier then mm. it's got way harder so but it would be great if it happens yeah well fingers crossed so on that we'll one and then obviously the book's still going strong i think you've got a bit more activity from what i've seen around the book as well coming up yeah i think i'm doing there's a thing in margate i'm doing margate bookie it's funny actually because um, I'm doing it with Matt Osmond from Suede. Like, we're doing an interview together. Um, he actually dropped his book around today. I felt very kind of Stella Street today because I got a knock on the door and it was Matt Osmond on his bike. And I was like, oh, <laughs> aren't I the indie super queen uh, getting my book delivered? So, yeah, I, know I was, but I wanted the book so I could do my homework before I get to talk to him on stage. So, yeah, and then we'll, do it, we'll, we'll be doing a set at that as well. So everybody needs to come along and watch us and clap. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. That, it sounds like you've got so much going on. It sounds like a really great time for kind of, for kind of yourself and a really exciting future ahead. And I'm, I'm chuffed that uh, things are going as they are for you. So if anyone's listening, I'm sure everyone already does, but in case anyone's listening and doesn't follow you, Mickey, on social media, doesn't know how to keep in touch with what you're doing, what where where can you be found? I'm on, um, I think I'm on, oh, actually, I'm on Instagram and Twitter or whatever the fuck it's called now, as um, I think it's Brenny underscore Mickey. For some reason, Mickey Brenny was already taken. Oh, I no think. Way. <laughs> like, um, yeah, what the fuck? Anyway, and um, on Facebook, I've actually got the official Lush account because when I when I sort of started posting on it, I mean, Emma and Phil basically wanted to shut it down, and I just thought, well, that seems a bit fucking stupid. So mm. I was, <laughs> I'll just take it over then. <laughs> So and also I couldn't change the name on it. If anyone knows how to change the fucking name on Facebook for an account, <laughs> I suspect it might be impossible. I but think it might be. so anyway, it's on there. But yeah, I, I announce everything on there. I'm very very bad at picking up messages, and I usually just ignore abuse. Now I used to kind of rise to it. Right. 
sometimes I still do if I've had enough wine, but I've learned it's a bit of a pointless fucking thing, isn't it? It's the, it's the shit side of social media. Yeah. Why? It just drives me crazy. Really does. I Although I have stopped, you know, kind of being drunk and slagging off the Tories or whatever. You know, <laughs> I did get called out on that where someone was like, well, I think some of your fans vote Tory. And I thought, no, fair play. I, I have, I have. Hey, some of my best friends are Tories. Well, maybe not best friends, but some of my friends. So you know, I don't, <laughs> don't want to damn everyone to hell. You know what I mean? Some acquaintances. <laughs> are, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Mickey can be found on all those social media platforms. So that is it, everyone. Thank you for listening to the 137th episode of the Fantastical Podcast. If you've enjoyed this one, you can subscribe and give the podcast a review on iTunes. Or if you're listening on Spotify, you can uh, rate the show and you can also uh, leave a comment about the episode if you're listening on Spotify. We are also on Twitter, as is Mickey, so you can find the podcast at Fantastical P on Twitter. And if you're not on Twitter and want to contact the podcast, you can do so at Fantastical Podcast at Outlook.com. Unfortunately, on this podcast, we don't play music, but I'll get some tracks from Mickey about the albums and the artists she's spoken about. We'll get a nice little playlist. So if anyone wants to go and listen to some of those acts, will you be able to do so? Just scroll down in the episode description and you'll find a link there to a nice little playlist. So, Mickey, a massive thank you for being my 137th guest. I know you're a very busy woman. You've got lots going on. How did you find it? Because I know you've spoken about doing some top 10 things and it might be routine, but it sounds like you had to think about your fantastical lineup quite a bit, which makes me immensely pleased. Well, I mean, I, I do think about all of those things, you know, like when I'm asked to do, um, I probably shouldn't. Like I'm, sh- you know, you. It's funny you saying that because I, I kind of thought everybody does. You know, what I mean, I thought everybody treats it like fucking desert island this yeah, or something. Do, yeah. Thinks, oh, right, what am I going to pick? And you kind of like look through your albums. Oh, I don't know, and you agonise. And but it's quite a nice exercise because it sort of, it's actually a way that I sometimes go back to records I haven't listened to for a long time because mm. I think, oh, is this band as great as I remember them being? And then I put on the record and I go, yeah. Yep, still great. <laughs> like, you know, so it's quite a good um, trigger to to re-listen to stuff. And so, and this was no different. And like I said, it made me think about it a bit differently because it was about seeing bands live, hmm. you know, rather than just favourite records or favourite singles. Like I've got to stand there for a whole set and enjoy it. You know, I don't want to just wait for the hit and go, yeah, love that song. You can keep the rest of it. I'm going to the bar. You know, I want to be there the whole time dancing involved down the front so got, got to be consistently good bands do you know what i mean yeah so. I, think, I think you've done a great job in in your lineup and like we said five new acts who haven't been spoken about before which is what it's all about so <laughs> i think that's quite an achievement that, that is I quite an so achievement myself. some people get three or four but to get a whole you've almost you've got the full house of the podcast <laughs> so to speak so yeah thanks for joining me like i said Best of luck with the uh, tour with Gang of Four and with the new album, with the book. I look forward to reading the book. We'll get a bit more time. I'm looking forward to having a read of that one. So I'll be back next week, everyone, with episode number 138. So please make sure to join me. But until then, stay safe, my fantastical friends. Please continue to spread the word. And that word is fantastical. Thanks for listening. (laughs) 